Good morning, guys. I hope that you are doing well. Today, we're going to go over chapter four of Physics 101, motion in two dimensions. And we actually started this already. So today, we're going to, we're going to focus on projectile motion, which we haven't covered yet. So as I mentioned before, in chapter two, we started working on working with motion, right? And we had a set of kinematic equations. However, that was for motion in one dimension, right? And we're going to want to be able to analyze things that are moving in two dimensions, such as a ball flowing, just flying across like a river, right? And let's say like on a golf course or something. I don't know. Oh, like a golf, a golf ball heading from one side to the other. We're going to want to be able to analyze that and find out like how far it's going to go, its distance traveled, etc. So projectile motion is where that's going to come in handy. So important points to make are that projectile motion is in two dimension. I'll just write 2D. Um, is only subject to gravity. Subject only to gravity. With the exception of the initial propulsion. And that's it. Um, if there's going to be any. And also, for the most part, at least in this chapter, the effect of air resistance is negligible. I hope I wrote that right. Is negligible, right? And so, um, this these key these are pretty much ideas that are gonna these just generalize the situations that we're going to be analyzing in this chapter right so since projectile motion is in two dimensions we must treat horizontal and vertical motions separately right um and this is going to be very very important it's going to help us solve pretty much every single question okay so this is basically the kinematics of projectiles of projectiles get my ruler okay so um, I'm gonna write that over here since projectiles motion is in 2D, we will treat horizontal and vertical motions separately. Right? This is going to be a very important key in solving projectile motion problems. Um, and so because we are only, um, the only force in this situation is gravity, in the situation that we're going to meet, we know that the acceleration in terms of x will be, I'll just eliminate that, in terms of x will be 0, and the acceleration in terms of y will be negative Eight, nine, negative 9.8 meters per second. Oh, I forgot the square over there. Don't want to forget that. And this is actually the reason that we can separate, um, we can basically separate the x components of the y components in um, projectile motion. Okay? So, as a result of this, um, as a result of these accelerations also being constant, we're going to be able to use our handy uh, kinematic equations, right? They're going to be a little bit different, but just because the acceleration in terms of x is actually like non-existent, and that in terms of y is negative 9.8. And an example of, like maybe you have trouble visualizing this, but just imagine um, someone throwing, someone is on a building, they have a ball, and they throw it strictly 
with a velocity of x, let's say like 9 meters per second. I think that's pretty fast. But yeah, 9 meters per second, right? And if we try to see what initial velocity in terms of y he had, let's say it's 0 meters per second, okay? Um, well, in this situation, the ball is just going to travel like this. And the distance that it travels will be the same as though he was on the ground, right? Because, and the reason for that is, um, well, no, 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 hold on. I, actually, I, I'm, I'm not saying this correctly. Yeah, so basically the speed of this ball will be the same as, oh, actually, why am I saying this? Why, why is this so, so weird? Yeah, so basically in this situation, we can um, decompose motion. Once again, we can um, strictly analyze the motion of, yeah, this is, this is what I'm trying to say. We can strictly analyze the motion in terms of x, in which case there is no acceleration whatsoever, meaning, um, and because we're, we're not considering air resistance, the, ba the ball, if not for the y component, would just keep going and going and going. There's nothing stopping it, right? It has a constant velocity. And as a result of that, the final velocity and the initial velocity will be the same in terms of x, right? And that will not always be the case. It's just in this situation, right? So, yeah, pretty much. We're going to dive into some problems that will help us understand. Before that, we are going to write out our kinematic equations, since they will be a little bit different, as I said, because of the difference in acceleration in terms of x and in terms of y. I'm going to write all of them out for you guys. Kinematic equations for projectile motion. Maybe I can make that M a capital M. There we go. There we are. Okay. So we're going to have the X equations over here and the y equations over here. So starting with x, we have x of f, so the final position of x, is equal to the initial velocity of x. It's t plus the initial position, right? Next, we have the final velocity in terms of x is equal to the initial velocity in terms of x. And that's what I was trying to say earlier in that little skip. Um, we have the final position is equal to the initial velocity times time, which is plus the, pos the initial position. As you'll realize, these are identical. And finally, we have, again, a repetition of a formula. Right? These are the same and these are the same. And you're going to see why. I'm actually taking the four equations that we had before and um, taking into account that acceleration is equal to zero. Right? And notice that in, these, in, this circumstance, in these circumstances, one, well, for each equation, there was supposed to be one variable only missing, but now you see there are a couple. I'll still write which ones they are, though. The first one, there was supposed to be the velocity, the final velocity missing. And the second one, there's supposed to be the final position missing. And the third one, there's supposed to be the acceleration missing, which it clearly is everywhere, actually. And then finally, the last one, we're supposed to have time missing. Okay, and that basically helps us choose from these formulas in every problem. Next, we have the y components. Of motion right the y kinematic equations and these ones are pretty much the same thing as what we had before the only difference is that instead of x we're gonna have y and all the components will be in terms of y except for time of course since you can't have a time in terms of y time in terms of x all right there's time plus y. I'm not gonna read these out it's not gonna help you guys 
y is equal to a y t plus v i y. I'm writing i and y to just say that it's the initial velocity in terms of y. Here we have y of f is equal to one half final velocity in terms of y plus initial velocity in terms of y times time plus the initial position. And then here we have final velocity in terms of y squared plus the initial velocity in terms of y squared plus two acceleration in terms of y, y f minus y i. Okay, here we go. And here we basically have everything. We see these, I, I line these up so that the time, there's no time in this, in this equation. There's no acceleration in this equation. There's no final position in this equation. There's no final velocity in this, in this equation. So basically we have everything we need to solve some problems, right? And yeah, if you want, you can pause the video, take note of these. I'm gonna go ahead and erase them. So we're going to erase the title. Now we're just going to go over a few properties of um, motion in two dimensions that could help us solve some problems, right? We have all the tools we need, now maybe some knowledge, right? So first of all, projectile motion is parabolic. We'll follow the path of a parabola, basically. Parabolic. Next, we have at the, oh, I'm not going to separate those letters, at the apex, the velocity in terms of y is zero. Okay, I'm going to explain that in just a second. Throughout the trajectory, v of x is constant as i mentioned before that's why it's the same at the start and at the end and then we have v motion is symmetric around the apex and i hope that look i hope i didn't write too badly so now let's go ahead and explain all of these so the projectile motion is parabolic. What it, basically what that means is it's going to resemble something like this, right? And let's say the ground is here and initial velocity is that. Okay. And what's basically bringing it down, actually this will look a little bit more like, it'll look a little bit more like this. There you go. Even if there's an obstacle in the way and it lands on that obstacle, it's supposed to land over here. If there wasn't that obstacle, it's still a parabola. And at the apex, which is actually the summit, like over here, right? I'll put, I'll have to like draw a dot. At that point, V of Y is equal to zero. So if you considered only the Y components, basically what would happen throughout this cor the course of this para parabola, this motion, is the velocity would decrease as it goes up because it's facing, it's trying to go against the gravity, against gravity, and it's gonna reach a max point. Oh, it's gonna reach a, a summit, an apex, and then it's gonna fall back down with a negative velocity, right? Negative y velocity. And basically for it to go like that, to change from going in a positive direction to a negative direction, the ball needs to stop, or the particle, it needs to stop. And at that very point, we know that V of Y is equal to zero. And that's going to be per actually pretty dang important to solve questions, especially ones that just, that just involve a ball going up and down. Finally, um, we have two more properties. Throughout the trajectory, V of X is constant, as I said. If you consider the V of X component of this initial velocity, it will be the same as the final velocity in terms of x over there. And that's just because there's no acceleration acting on it. The motion is symmetric around the apex. And what we mean by that is if you drew a line between the plane that the plane and the apex, you would have two 
symmetrical sides. And that's pretty much it. That can be helpful in a, in a handful of situations. Okay, I think now, now that we've discussed quite a little bit of kinetic, kin, um, kinematics in two dimensions, I think it's worth it to try a problem, right? And that'll be the end of our lecture for today, or a quick review. So, practice problem. That's not a very good M, is it? <laughs> I'm gonna get a sip of water real quick. Okay, so a cannonball cannonball of mass thirty five kilograms is fired with a an initial velocity of 50 meters per second with, no, at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the ground. All right? Okay. The first question is asking us, question A, part A, is asking to find the time of flight. Find the time of flight. Okay, so when I think of these questions, when I, when I answer projectile motion questions, usually I like to just decompose what we have. We'll just like write down what we have in terms of x and in terms of y, right? One important first um, mention is that this cannonball is being fired at an angle, right? An angle precisely of 30, was it 35? 45 degrees, right? 45 degrees. And so we have, so this is the initial velocity. We are going to have a, a y component and an x component to that velocity. In order to find those, well, actually, I think it's worth just finding out what both of those are for the sake of the next questions. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, VIX actually is equal to VIY in this situation um, because it's a 45 degree angle. So we're going to actually have two of the same two. The value of X and Y are equal. Right in this situation, it's a very special situation. It's a a right isosceles triangle. Right? I hope that's so. That, I hope I said that right. So because of that, we have two sides that have the same length, and so let's calculate one of them. So the magnitude of vi times the cosine of forty five or the sine should give us the same answer. And so the co the magnitude. Here is, I can maybe write it out for you guys, 50 times 45 degrees. Yeah, there we go. 50 times cosine of 45 gives us 35.35533906. I wrote out a, a whole lot of decimals. It's not really necessary at all. Let me just write that over here, though for future reference. 35.35533906. And of course, meters per second. Okay, we figure out that. Now what? They're asking for the time of flight. And when they ask for the time of flight, at least in this scenario, it's worth noting that so let's think about what's going to influence the time of flight. Why is it even in flight? The only reason it is in flight is because of the x component of the velocity, the initial velocity. If it wasn't for that, the initial velocity in terms of x would not be throwing it up in the air. So that's why I'm encouraging us to just take, to only consider 
those value the y components for this question so let me just write our answer down over here 906 meters per second right and we're trying to find time do we know how far we went no well in terms of y do we no we don't we don't know we know that we started at y is equal to zero meters um we know that the final velocity is the, the final position actually um will eventually be zero again i'm gonna go like this and hit zero um so y final is equal to zero meters um, and this is actually like another place where we can discuss displacement right so you can clearly see that the the um, yeah, we can clearly see that the cannonball will have traveled a certain distance, but at the end of the day, its displacement will be zero because it started at a certain point, it ended at that same point. It could have been five meters and it ended at five meters. Regardless, um, because it ends at the same place where it started, we have similar values and thus a displacement of zero. Okay, we also have an acceleration of nine, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, right? And so because we're looking for time, and note that we don't have the final velocity in terms of y, right? But we're not looking for that, so we can actually exclude that value. We can find a formula that does not require it. So we're going to use this formula. plus VIY times time. I actually already put in the acceleration here in case you're a little unfamiliar with what equation I am using. I mean, I, let me write that out fully, to not confuse you guys. One half the acceleration. And at the end we have YI. Okay, and that's it. Now all we need to do is plug in our values, and what we will get is the following. Plus 35, 3, 5, 5, I'm excessive with these decimals, plus 0. And this is basically a quadratic expression. We can solve it without using our calculators, but I'm going to do it to be precise negative 4.9, especially that we don't have a value of c, we don't need to use the quadratic expression, we can solve it manually, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So why not? Okay. And we end up with t1 equal to 7.21538837. Again, a little too many decimals. The next one is equal to zero. And so um, here you might be asking yourself, wait, I have, no, I have two values of time. What, what do I choose? Well, if you think about it, this, the first value is just like basically saying at some point in the parabola's trajectory, motion, the, tra the particle's motion, it will hit the position of zero in terms of y at t is equal to 7 seconds, 7.21 seconds. But time 2 is just saying that it started at 0, basically, as in at point 0, at time 0, which is at this point, it was at point 0, which we already know. So it's not this, this isn't the result we're looking for. So the answer is this. If you want, you can round it up, but that is the answer. Next. The next question is asking for the range of the projectile find the range of the projectile okay the range of the projectile now this is actually a bit more tricky to answer especially if we hadn't answered this first question the range that it'll cover is solely dependent on delta well it's not only dependent on the x components but it will it's the the component, the x component of the initial velocity that will tell us um, how far it will eventually go, 
at a certain time, right? But we need to know that it stops at, a, at some point. And luckily for us, we just measured that time. We know that at 7.22 seconds, 21.5, 7.215 seconds or so on, uh, at that point, the object has stopped moving. And thus, if we plug in that value, along with what we already know, into a one of the kinematic equations for the x components, we can find out the answer. And so we're going to do x of f. It's going to be x of f is equal to v times t plus x of i, right? That is the right equation. And we know that we start, we're trying to find x final, right? So that's going to stay on this side. We know the initial velocity, it is this. We know the time that it took, right, to get to the final point. And the initial velocity, then the initial position is zero. So let me just multiply this times that. And let's see, what does that give us? The answer to that would actually be 200, about 251, the 255 about equal to 255.101201 one meters. And you can round that to how many decimal places you want. Right, and that's the range. That's basically this distance. Okay, and finally we have one final question. What is the maximum height for the projectile? And now we're actually gonna use one of the properties that I was talking about earlier. Maybe I didn't need to erase all of that. This question C is asking for the maximum height of the particle. Find the maximum height of the particle. And the way that we find this is, seems it seems a little bit difficult, right? All we know is that at some point in its motion, it will hit its apex. And at that very point, we will um, have achieved our maximum height, right? But how do we find that? Since it, the height of the particle only depends on the y component, y components of every, like, of velocity and of position, um, because of that, we can just analyze it in terms of one, one dimension. So the particle goes up, stops, goes down. And what did I say earlier about the motion? What did I say earlier about the final velocity of y when it hits that point? Well, actually, it's zero. For it to change directions, it has to go, the final velocity has to be zero at some point. So we basically have our answer. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna erase some of these values since they're from a previous part of the question. The initial, velo the initial position is zero meters per sec, uh, zero meters, but the final velocity is, the final position is what we're looking for. So these are all valid. We don't know the time, but we're actually not gonna care here. We're gonna exclude that from our equation. And as a result, we're gonna use this equation. Final velocity in terms of y squared plus final velocity no, initial velocity in terms of y squared plus 2a um, delta y. Okay, and delta y is built up of final, veloc final position minus initial position. This heads towards zero, and we can just plug in our values. The final velocity is zero. The initial velocity is we have the value of the initial velocity in terms of y. I'm not going to plug it in because it'll be a little bit of a mess. And we have 2a y f. And if we isolate this value, well, we can isolate that value by doing this. Squared divided by 2a is equal to y of f. And then we can just plug in our values, 35.355. 3906 squared 
times negative one, right? Because the negative, and then divided by two times negative 9.8. We get an answer of, oh, hold on, did I make a little bit of a mistake? Hmm, where, I didn't multiply by that. What did I do wrong? I feel like I did something wrong. I'm not getting the answer. Oh, I, I just forgot a parenthesis in my calculator. Okay. All right, now we get the answer we're looking for, which is 63.77569, yada, yada, yada. And this is meters. So this is our final answer. Great job, guys. You just, find, you just found out the maximum height that a particle can go just by looking, at, just by knowing a couple of um, variables, just by knowing like the the angle at which it starts, uh, as in like the angle at which it's fired, um, its initial velocity, and that's it, pretty much. Note that the mass was not relevant in this situation, not at all. We did not need to care about mass since we're working only with kinematics, and that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video where we will be discussing rotated coordinate systems and uniform circular motion as well as non-uniform circular motion. All right, see you guys then. Bye-bye.